Welcome everyone, Lisa Sanford here from Alta Sciences. I'm here with my friend and industry leader, Kurt Nielsen from Expert Insights. Kurt, how are you? I'm doing great, it's great to see you, Lisa. Awesome, thank you so much for taking some time from your busy schedule, from summer fun. I know you just got back uh, from European trip, so really happy to have you here. Maybe we could just jump right in. Sounds good. All right, yeah. awesome. Awesome. So um, I think let's start with, you know, the economic environment. We're seeing a lot of changes from, you know, potential Biosecure Act. We're seeing changes in the regulatory environment. Definitely of concern, I'm sure, for especially our biotech clients out there. So what are you seeing? Is there still big desire for offshoring or are we seeing kind of a migration towards North American providers? I love this question um, <laughs> because uh, so I've been doing this for a long time, uh, almost 30 years now. And I remember when I say first started in the business, you know, when I was knee high to a grasshopper. 12, right. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, there was a push to variableize cost, whether it was manufacturing costs or development costs. And so that meant you would move to, and because it was a labor dominated um, activity, you would move to markets where the labor wages were right. lower, right? So, Makes sense. The pendulum swings all the way through, you know, Europe, then to Asia, India, and then China. And I think, um, in the pursuit of um, lower costs and uh, the, um, uh, I think globalization took over. But I think uh, that what's happening now is you have so many um, good providers of services throughout the world. Right. You don't have to go to any particular part of the world to get the type of service that you need okay. uh, at the price that you want to pay. To so said another way, you've got great talent all over the world. So that I think has been a huge change over the last 30 years. And so I think that's part of what's driving um, decision makers to be comfortable with taking their supply chain from truly global yeah. to say regional or local. Okay, They've got great choices um, in their backyard and in the markets that they're serving. Yeah, sure. Always great to be close to home, right? And, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm close to home here, so <laughs> you're the one who had to drive all the way from Connecticut to that's get here. That's true. That's true. So for, that's still close. East Coast. I'm yeah, good. Exactly. I'm so good. We're, just we're, a highway away. So. <laughs> Very yeah, good. definitely closer than halfway around the world and, and prefer to be on my time zone so wow. I can see how that's advantage. Okay, so you know, if you're closer to home, are you are you doing like your API synthesis here and then you're looking for a provider where you can do your formulation, you could do your full scale manufacturing, your commercial scale up, you wanna kinda of pick one provider, or is the trend more to pick specialists in the different areas and move you know, move the work around, or where where do you think that trend is going? I thought they were going to be all softball questions. So <laughs> another great another great question with a lot of um, I think great um, great pathways or uh, great avenues we can go down. But I think I think what what we're seeing is that um, I think there's some fundamental differences when you're looking at um, let's say early development, yep. uh, preclinical development, where you're doing your API synthesis. And obviously your preclinical work, yeah. uh, and then ultimately a little more fluid there, right? And I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think um, there you're still much more likely to be offshore and working in certain parts of the world. Why? Because I still think that, notwithstanding what I said before, you've got some pretty amazing talent. Yeah, good it comes chemistry, to, yeah. good like yeah, exactly. And, and, and look, it's it's hard to beat. You know, when you go work with a company, they they've done. You know, five thousand synthetic routes, right? You right. just you're not necessarily going to have that type of experience all over the okay. all over the world, like say with some something else we're talking about, the maybe finished dose manufacturing, whether it's sure. um, tablets or even even sterile fill finish these days. Um, so I think that there's there's some differences, um, but I think the other thing to me that's really interesting is that um, the decision making around whether you go with a single service provider, right? Yeah. I'm kind of beginning to end of your program. Mm -hmm. Or you go with a more of a kind of a, a, a menu approach where you're kind of picking and choosing. I always thought it depended on uh, the size of the company. Yep. 
but it actually for me now what I see a lot more of is it depends on the decision maker where do they think they get the benefit from like, okay. what is their objective okay. so some decision makers time right nobody's making any more time so yep. that time is very valuable to me so and who's gonna where can I send it where they're gonna maximize my investment and my accelerate basically because absolutely money. okay yeah, it's like that so let's let's say I I, I want the end-to-end -end solution because I don't want to have to worry about the interfaces between companies right because that's where systems right. fail at the interface right so I'll go to Alta science and say listen we got this idea I want to work with you to take me from beginning to end. Yeah. Right. But there's, I, I talk with some decision makers, and because of the way they view the world, they say, I want to have the exact right expertise for this exact right activity. And so, because you, if you believe or when you believe that that's where you get your time advantage, you're going to put the time in to say, all right, in this particular case, the best solution provider for me is going to be you know, some combination of fill in the blank in terms of you know the different service providers yeah so for me as I've kind of come through this um, this business it's it's a lot more about people and what they know and what they where they think there's an advantage based on their experience much more than it's some macroeconomic yeah. concept or it must policy. be interesting evolution for you because you know here you're working like four CDMOs yeah and I'm sure you're you know you're You've got your clients. You're consulting. You're you're trying to you know customize what they need, and I'm sure you're thinking, hey, we can be we can be all things to you guys, and you know maybe that's appealing, maybe that's not appealing, and now I think that you're also in a consultancy role, like you're not necessarily like just representing a single CDMO. I'm sure now you're seeing a lot more tailored approach. So maybe walk me through a little bit more on how you kind of seen that change over the years, where you know. Maybe it was more self-contained mm -hmm. at a CDMO, and now maybe you have clients that are very strategic in where they're going to place the work so that they can, you know, maximize. Maybe give your give your opinion on that. So what I find works really well is when you're sitting with the you know with the decision maker. It's for, it's it's just so helpful to understand what their history is and what their experiences have been. Where they're and, from, yes. what they're looking for, right? Yeah, and, and where where there have been challenges and problems because that informs how they view what the future is going to be like. <laughs> they're right? like, never going there, yes, yes. never using them, yes, yeah. I'm sure. Right, and, and, and unless you engage in a conversation with somebody, you don't learn those things, right? Because there's what's on the, there's what's on the RFP, which is generally helpful, but it's yeah. not sufficient. Right. Um, and I think um, so. You've checked the boxes: capability, yes; ability to do this, yes. But now it's really going to come down to like service providing, asking, okay, what are you looking for? How can we help you? How can we bring you to the best solution together? Basically, like so, this customization. And, and I think, I think that for me, like this is another great question because you use that phrase, check the box, right? So. I think because the level of sophistication today is yeah. so high between the, the, to the, the providers and the, and the people who need these services that you can very quickly get to a point where you're like, they have what I need. Yeah. Okay? So if I'm on the buy side, right, Alta Sciences has what I need. The other part of the conversation that's much more interesting these days is, yeah, but I'm going to be working with these people for two, three, maybe four years. Right. Are they going to be the same company two or three, four years from now? That's a really are they good going point. to be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different, but different in a way that's better, right? Right. It still works for us. So, a lot of times people used to, to talk about culture, the culture yeah. of the business. Uh, start talking about well, what kind of turnover has been at the service provider, and things like not only do people need to be experienced, but are they long tenured at the business? Right? Do they actually listen to what I have to say? Yeah. Uh, do they acknowledge that things almost never go right in our business? They never go right. So when <laughs> so somebody, what do we do about it? Yeah, right? like some people like, say, "Oh, here's this tech transfer, and it's going to go great." Yep. You obviously have never done one, right? <laughs> <laughs> and probably not the same in two labs, right? No, never the same in two locations. No, uh, this no... kind of transcends our industry, I think. So yeah, absolutely. Um, interesting. Absolutely. Yeah, interesting. so a lot more. Uh, it, it's not. It's not all, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, buyers are thinking about those things, but they're, 
there's more and more, I'd say, on a regular basis who are really asking yeah. these questions around what's it going to be like to, to really work with. Yeah. You know, well, I love that stars. approach, of course. Um, you know, definitely subscribe to that. I think that's really the tailored way to go with a client, get to know them, build the relationship. We're looking for partnerships, right? Like it's always, um, you know, going to be, uh, something new when it's your first project you do have to get to know each other you have to understand expectations what people expect what they're looking for how they're going to work with you so are you seeing with your role now are you seeing that cdmos are sort of catering to this like i'm sure there's some that are like we know best and this is how we're going to follow and then i'm sure you're seeing more of a merge to this um more tailored approach so is there any evolution there in sort of the thought from a cdmo so I don't know if the camera can see the sweat. Like all these questions, these questions are really good. I'm from killing him. I'm killing him. I know. You really I are. You go to bed last night, like you know, for like, like two in the morning or something. So, so I'm glad I got the extra made him shot. drive this morning. No problem. Because <laughs> I'm no glad problem. I got the extra shot here. Only um, because he's my friend. But um, the uh, <laughs> okay. the uh, this talk around partnership. Yeah. So uh, I'd say most service providers talk about partnership, but I say very few actually, kind in of my walk. view. Kind of walk, right? Just, like, like, how do you then take this word partnership and translate it into, yeah. you know, in, into action? And I think um, there are, uh, for me at least, there's there's a couple of handfuls of companies, companies I think I do, you know, that, that they do it really well. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had the distinct you know, pleasure of meeting uh, some of the people on the Alta Sciences team when we were in Boston. Yep. Uh, and uh, it, it to me, like it, you can't kind of make that happen, right? Like, okay, so like I'm a, I'm a chemistry nerd, right? So in chemistry, like, right. When you can see that in with the service provider that there's chemistry between the people that you're working with, like it yes. becomes exciting to say, you know, I want to work with these people because they're so good at what they do and they understand that they're a service provider and I'm going to get. So for me, like that's partnership. So I think the big, the really short answer around that yeah. is I think say everybody is talking about partnership, but there's just a couple of handfuls of companies that, that actually through. really see it through yeah. and do it and can yeah. actually deliver yeah. that for you, right? And 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 and, and do it in a way that is I say you know organic. Exactly, exactly. And I think that it's you know it really comes through. I think when there's I love the the word chemistry because I think that's what makes partnerships work. There needs to be chemistry amongst the internal team members of the service provider that's helping you, and then you have to have the chemistry with the client as well. Um, yeah. You know, you can have the fanciest building facilities you know, a thousand projects that look just like theirs under your belt. But if they don't like you, if they don't get a good vibe when you walk in, if there isn't that kind of commonality and culture mission, what they're there to do, it's not going to come together. Right. And I think any, you know, it always starts with a transaction. We have to do a single project before we can really become partners, but that, you know, I think you have to come in that spirit of partnership to start, right? And I I think a service provider, as much as a client would evaluate a service provider, I think service providers also have to evaluate, are they a good match to the client's goals and, and to the objectives? I think it's important that, you know, CDMOs, CROs, they have to know what they're good at, what their core competencies are, so that they can then be a better partner in return, you know, to the client. I should be I should be interviewing you. <laughs> All right, well, I, you're going to hire me at some point, right? An expert insight. Sorry, Alta Sciences. Future, future, many years from now. It's just it's just great to um, hear that that's your perspective on it too. I I, I think, think that's missing. what works. I think just, that's what works. Yeah. So you know, I, I also started when I was 12. So I've been <laughs> focused on partnerships for over you know 20 years myself. And the ones that, you know, I've certainly been involved in and have seen evolve to a really, you know, great degree have that element. See, because when you talk about those types of things, I think that also then makes the entire process, the down, I'll call the downstream process to get started on the project that much easier, right? So all the things that need to happen around the um, appreciation, I would say for the, um, service providers business model. Um, I think 
a lot of times on the buy side, I would think that there's not an appreciation for that, right? Because you use the word transaction, right? right. Transaction is, look, it's, yes, there's an economic exchange, so yes, it's a transaction, right. but at the end of the day, if too many people on either side treat it as a transaction, then every step of the way it's a transaction, and guess what happens? Now there's a lot of friction, right? and that takes time and energy, and we all need to put that time and energy into developing the treatments that Exactly. are going to make people's lives better like that's the noble cause like that's really what exactly. we need to be doing and i think well there's a lot of terrible things that came out of COVID. one of the things that was really amazing for me to see is that when everybody gets focused look at what can be done unstoppable absolutely, absolutely amazing mm -hmm. like, for all the tragedy that occurred yes. how many countless lives were saved because enough people stakeholders actually got together and said yeah. this is important yeah it's absolutely incredible yeah uh, and so. the knowledge sharing like the technology platforms that were out there and the knowledge sharing you know usually it's a very proprietary sort of you know obviously novel uh, therapies you know there's not necessarily a lot of uh, you know thinking and sharing of that thought and thinking because of competitive you know competitiveness um, but I thought during COVID, you know, there was a lot of coming together and like, hey, we have a technology platform that could be applied to this mm. and we can do this very quickly. And I was really amazed at the speed in which some of these therapies came out. So just, just incredible. I mean, this is another, this is another great uh, insight because I think the emphasis in the past has been on what does anybody have that's different and yeah. how I control what's different. Yeah. Look, that's important, right? Trademarks and intellectual property, that's all important. It needs to be respected globally. There's no question about that. It's an entry ticket. It's not sufficient. What really makes the difference, and this is what this has been my experience over 30 years, is you got to be able to get things done. Yeah. And yeah. that's where the magic happens because every step of the way in development and what we do there's always going to be something unexpected you can't predict what's going to happen in the next moment let alone tomorrow right. as it relates to product development right. so how do you make sure that you're agile you're nimble you have the right people on the team right and yeah. to me like this is the magic of the ecosystem that has evolved between people with ideas yeah. about products yeah. and companies that have the ability to execute and bring those things into reality. Exactly. Just exactly. like what happened with COVID, just like what happens with the, the countless treatments that uh, you know our respective clients and companies are working with. Absolutely. It's just amazing, but we got to stay focused on how do we execute and what tools are we going to use to continue to evolve yeah. that process, right? I mean maybe a topic for, you know, for, for a different, different day, but there's been a lot that's been happening with, with tools, right? And, and maybe, you know, so something So like first. AI, predictive right. models, right? Modeling of, of uh, outcomes. And then, I mean, at the end of the day, right? It's emerging data is going to determine change of formulations, flexibility that needs to happen. Um, so to your point, you know, you really do need to be an agile provider. You need to really be forward thinking. Like you can think about the project that they've come to you for and the need that they have at that moment. But I loved how you said earlier, like, is this going to transcend two years from now, three years from now, four years from now? Because there is going to be a lot of emerging data that's going to potentially need to, to pivot what they're mm -hmm. working on mm -hmm. and you know CDMO needs to be ready right so I love we're talking about therapies too because I'm curious you know I, I see protocols every day we obviously see a lot of work in here um, small molecule seems to be still alive and well mm. um, <laughs> right right large molecule cell and gene therapy of course so what are you kind of seeing these days with um, therapeutic focuses on that, again, another great question. So I think, uh, like again, back in the day, right? I keep talking like a, uh, you know, yeah. I'm an old timer, but uh, everything was, and not everything, but the majority of uh, treatments were NCEs, small molecules, yep. and it was the rise of the biologics, right? So that was the, the rise of the companies like uh, you know, Amgen and Genentech. Um, you know, some, mm -hmm. some, I wasn't in the business at that time, but there's some great books like from Alchemy to IPO that were written about that time. So. I really came in the kind of the next wave of um, 
the next generation of people in the uh, in the in the pharma business. But um, the, at that time, it's kind of a long way to go to get to that answer. But at that time, the emphasis was small molecules. Then it was, oh, these large molecules are going to take over the market. Yeah, it didn't happen. Uh, still about split, yeah. I, I, and I think it's going to stay that way, right? And, and that's a, it's a really, for me, it's sort of a scientific wonky topic. Yeah. But, but look, the body is amazingly complex and incredible, and we haven't even begun to, to scratch the surface of druggable targets in the body. And because of that amazing complexity, there's always going to be a need for small molecules to, to modulate exactly. how the body is working. Exactly. Same thing with large molecules. And then it's just a natural evolution. Now cellular therapies. So in hindsight, look, it all makes sense. Like it's all part of the natural evolution. Um, at, at any specific point in time, we may we're, we're going to see that. Well, look at the FDA approvals. There's, I don't know, seventy five percent of the approvals are our large molecules. Yeah, look, that's a moment in time. Right. It's just like anything right. else. You need to take a look at long patterns. It's the same thing with the stock market. Yeah, is the stock market up today? Yeah. Is it down tomorrow? <laughs> yes. But fortunately. <laughs> but fortunately, yes. over the long it's recovering. haul, yes. yeah, it's going to recover. Exactly. We know that. And exactly. it's, I think it's the same thing as it relates to like, how, what's the distribution of these treatments going to, you know, going to be like? Yeah. I think one of the things that I, I think is going to persist for a little while longer, and just kind of get in, get into the economic topics, is like where is the money flowing right, right? Mm -hmm. and ultimately I think that drives what we see when it comes to FDA approvals and what we all see in our businesses and I think um, I think small molecules have been you know reinvigorated that's what uh, I think too right? like I, dusting them off the shelf yeah. and like and it's always gonna just be trying for something else and, yeah. and investors understand that process companies understand that process yep. how that works and then when you have a robust pipeline and you have some enabling platform discovery platform technology it makes sense to invest in those things. Yeah. Uh, uh, for, but as you start to talk about some of the more speculative biologics therapies, a little bit more challenging. But even now you have ADCs, right? ADCs are going to, be the, they're going to be the next big thing. Then there was the trough. Yeah. I don't know. It's not working. We're seeing a lot of fail, and now it's coming back again. Why? Because we more fully understand how they work and what the best exactly. drugable targets are now. And so that's another area we're going to. And I feel like investment. you know, there's a big push for better bioavailability, better formulating, like right you know, because they know how it's working and they know what they want it to do. But now it's does it you know degrade fifty percent once mm -hmm. I take it, mm -hmm. you know, it seems like CDMOs are really dialing in uh, to that aspect as well and uh, working closely with the, with the innovators mm -hmm. to do that. I, I, again, I think we're going to continue to continue to see that because to your point, there's, because there's going to continue to be more molecules like that coming through the pipeline, um, but bioavailability, we haven't seen a fundamental change in the solubility of drugs in mm -hmm. 30 years, right? Yeah. Again, that's just kind of the nature of the process that they that they go through. Um, and still in 30 years, we're still innovating to find new ways that um, get to the performance level, right? Not only in the body, but then you know, with respect to stability and how that uh, product performs over time. Like, yeah. We're still innovating there. So I, I just think it's... Well, I mean, I'll maybe the eternal optimist. Like I just think, I, I just <laughs> Me think too. This, this, this is a great business to be in. I agree. Look, uh, there's no shame in it that it's a business. Um, the ultimately, what gets produced is life saving, right? I've taken exactly. drug products that have saved my life, and I'm sure others have too. Um, and so, um, I'm, I'm grateful that we have these innovations. Me and too. That we're going to continue too. to do it, and um, I, I'm really excited about. You know, what's going to be in the future with these cellular with the cell therapies? Um, there's not enough money flowing into it right now yeah. because it's early. And uh, it's so personalized, right? Like it's really yeah. personalized medicine, right? Like what might work for you won't work for me necessarily, but just the thought that it can be customized yeah. to whatever might be going on with us individually is really, really exciting. You know, I think the other thing that's going to be interesting is going to be um, uh, mRNA therapy. Yes. Well, we already know. I mean, that works, right? Yeah. So Again, we've right. got it in millions of individuals, right? right. We've got and, it out there. So. And, I, and I love the simplicity of, or the focus of the statement, like it works. Um, I'm going to use that moving forward because, like, that's we know it works. So yeah. now it's it's a it's back to a, oh, so a drug delivery or a targeting problem. Mm -hmm. Like when we get that mRNA to the right place in the body, we know it's going to work. So. 
the next big breakthrough is going to come with you know, the liquid nanoparticles exactly. um, where they're able to actually deliver the mRNA to the place in the body where it's needed. It's and fascinating. <laughs> whole, whole new set of, of patients are going to be um, not only be able to have treatments but ultimately cures um, and that's yeah, that's it's really, within reach. Really exciting. It's not something we have to look. It's beyond the horizon. It's yeah. It's, you know, yeah. We're, we're, I'm going to see it before my career ends, right? So. Right. That's that's going to be a pretty nice full circle to come around so. there. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about platforms. We talked about technology, AI, other predictive models that are really really hot topics in drug development in general. Mm. I mean, what are you seeing? Is is that being implemented in any way, or you know, we still have to rely on the biological systems to tell us whether the science is working or not? Do you think we're close? Do you think we're so far away from sort of uh, moving more to that uh, to that world? So, I'm I'm going to answer, but I'm interested in your answer too because yeah, uh, you, know, you you see the you see you see the big wide world as well. So I think uh, that. Um, the AI and the machine learning and actually being able to harness big data is happening. Yeah, it's a great thing. Uh, I think it's it's happening much, much, much more when it comes to uh, drug development. Right. And there's some interesting papers that have been published where um, what they're showing is that even with the use of these tools, we're um, we're faster, but we're not actually identifying new targets, at least not yet. Right. So that's not a knock on the technology. Well, I, I view it and say, like, that's a great thing. Yeah. So what we've been doing for the, the last 75 years in drug development, we can now do with AI. I would never have expected that the first generation of application of AI, that all of a sudden now it's better than what we've been doing for 75 years. Yeah. Like, that's a great validation. Yeah. Now, you know, the, the, the really amazing things are going to happen. I think where it starts to be quite different is the application of these tools when it comes to, say, you know, manufacturing. Um, I think we still have a long way to go. I right. think you know, for companies that are um, have the capacity to make those invest in investments and have a long-term view, they're working on um, applications of, of that of those tools. One of the things that's really important, right, is to have a data set that's big enough, and that's a challenge that will be overcome. Yeah, I think the sharing. We're of data, still very young. Yeah, and then the sharing of data when you're in the, the discovery process, that's been part of the culture there for since the right. beginning, right? Right. Sharing sharing data so that you can have a big enough data set in manufacturing is a new concept, right? Yeah. This goes back to the point you were making earlier about um, kind of the circle the wagons, protective nature of like I sure, own this and, sure. and you don't. And, and I think my intellectual property. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I think there's Which it's understandable. And there's a lot of a lot of investment involved and so But I think there's fundamentally an enlightenment now around this particular topic to say, look, the data is important, but what's really important is what can we do with the data? How much faster can yeah. we work by pooling this data and, and making these larger data sets? And so I think that's kind of where one of the next big breakthroughs yeah. is going to come in. And I think um, one of the things that um, there's more talk, but there isn't the implementation, is the application of these AI tools when it comes to, let's say, um, assisting with uh, and supporting uh, regulatory compliance activities. I think there's much more application in the pharmacovigilance space. Yeah. I think there's a lot more talk about using it for QMS and manufacturing and yeah. development. Uh, I think there's an appropriate level of, um, to, let's see how this is all going to work out. What's the yeah. FDA going to do? Are they going to, um, what guidances are they going to issue around how you validate these tools? Um, so I think the conversation is good and I think there's an, I think an appropriate pace to the implementation. But I think well, that's the next big breakthrough for service providers. Because like, the biggest cost is um, people. Yeah. And when you can um, provide productivity tools to the people in your in your business. That's ultimately good for the service provider, and it's ultimately good for the customers, right? Yeah. And I'm old enough to remember Tom Peters, right? And he would talk about knowledge workers. And at that time, you know, I was a knowledge worker, and the, the big breakthrough was having Microsoft Office and having a word processor. Like that's how old I am, right? <laughs> um, 
we were talking about that earlier, right? That was that was before you know Apple, Apple and Google Maps, right? And yeah. you know we were we were like land pirates, and we go to uh, MapQuest and print out a map, and it was like a and treasure hunt. Call on the payphone. Yeah, exactly. You got yeah. Lost. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you here. It's always so enjoyable to talk to you. Uh, yeah, I thought the, the the first part of our conversation just fantastic. A lot of great topics. So yeah, yeah, let's keep going. All right. Well, for those of you that just tuned in, we're talking all things CDMO today, and in fact, we're totally on the fly. <laughs> Uh, literally, we're at the airport, um, Philadelphia airport, where Kurt has conveniently just landed last night, and uh, I drove down to meet him, and we're both off and running this afternoon, so hey, why not, right? We can, it's kind of the speed of our industry, right? It's, Very similar to the airport. It's time to take off. <laughs> All right, awesome. So uh, let's pick up where we left off. We were really talking about um, you know, AI and, and new technology platforms kind of informing drug development. Is it gonna inform you know, CDMO, mm -hmm. chemistry? Is it gonna help formulation, those types of things? And I know you were curious about my opinion on it as well. Um, you know, seeing the same thing, from an early development perspective, there's definitely quite a few service providers that are, you know, kind of touting, you know, model drug development and, and really looking at things earlier in discovery and lead candidate. And again, I think we're really in our our infancy of it, you know, the young part of it. Um, but I think there's a lot of possibility. Is it going to replace? I don't actually think it's ever going to replace. I think it's going to inform. I think it's narrowing the field, right? You know, before we were looking at all of this with the metal detector, you know, hoping to find the magic signal. And maybe now it's saying, well, just look in this area, you know, and still hopefully we find the magic target. But I don't know if that's kind of along what you're seeing as well. So I, I I feel the same way about it and I think that's that's what we're um, seeing and we're just kinda of kidding about this at the break, but um, you know, when I hear people say uh, you know AI is gonna replace fill in the blank, I just don't see it that way. And I actually want to ask that, that person like, did you actually use the tool? Because <laughs> it's incredibly helpful, right? But exactly. it's not sufficient and, and it'll be a long time before it's sufficient. That's what I think too. Um, but I think it, anything that's reasonable, right, that we can do to improve yeah. our efficiency and productivity. I agree. Yeah, let's do that. I agree. Uh, and I, I, agree. I think that's that's how we've got to this point and you know the evolution of you know what what we're doing on this planet and it's what's going to take us the rest of the way. Exactly. So let's keep doing that. Are you seeing investment from CDMOs? Yeah, actually, for, for me. Uh, <laughs> Again, I kind of use this phrase like one or two handfuls. It's just kind of a polite way to say there are a few that are talking about it. So it's, to me, it's a, a classic innovation adoption curve. Right. You've got your early adopters, and there's a couple of handfuls of those, and they're gonna they're gonna make the they're making the first moves. They're always gonna have that. The the bolus of companies are for whatever reason not jumping into the fray right now. There's okay. a whole host of reasons why they're okay. doing that. I'm not sure. Or they want to make the investment. You know, there's this incredible kind of evolution of which tool to use. So I liken it a little bit to like when, again, back in the day when we didn't have electronic <laughs> medical records and you had to actually write things down. Okay, <laughs> like there was this incredible You're array not that of old, so, so, I know, but I should say <laughs> seasons, right? But but um, you know, time marches on and things change. And and when you have that perspective of seeing things happen over a period of time, you see these patterns, right? And these patterns have existed long before we've been here. They'll exist long after, you know, we're gone. And so um, these are the types of innovation cycles. Um, that's yeah. how they happen. They're going to continue to happen that way. And, and, and I think if we look at uh, those types of um, situations in the past, we can learn a lot about what is driving the adoption curves today? Why is there that similarity? Because people are involved. Right. And right. the way we make decisions hasn't really evolved that much right. in 20 years, 30 years. Right. And, it's, and it's not going to change that much. So okay. I think there's a lot of clues there. But that was a very long philosophical answer <laughs> to yes, early adopters are well into their um, use of the technology. Okay. I think over time we'll see more and more companies jump into the fray as it becomes easier to do so. For so whatever. these early adopters and where you're seeing the industry going, I know you spend a lot of time on M&A, mm. evaluations, uh, you know, ad advice, consultancy. So 
M and A being driven by: Am I investing in these platforms? Am I buying a company that I'm going to bolt on to? You know, the manufacturing expertise that I already have. So, what are you what are you seeing there? What are you what are you thinking is is going on in the industry there? So, I think from a from an M and A perspective, I think um, look, it's just like anything else. Like, yeah, it depends on where you sit in the. In the in the city, right? Like yeah. If, you, if you're in the penthouse, like, hey, everything's great. You're seeing plenty of deal flow. And if you're if you're more ground level, right, you have a very different view. Um, but I think um, we're going to continue to see increasing M and A um, uh, activity um, really throughout all segments of the market, small, medium, and large. Yeah. Like for, again, for all the classic reasons, like you know, for um, uh, you know. Just this kind of great classic, you know, text on uh, you know com uh, competitive forces and competitive analysis, right? The, you know, written by uh, Michael Porter, right? So those forces are still at play. So yeah. for all those reasons, we're going to continue to see um, new innovation, new companies start. We're going to see consolidation for all those for all those same reasons. I'll see that changing. I think where uh, you know, I think we're going to see some new and different things. Uh, I think what we're going to see is that um, there's going to be a bifurcation in terms of um, what investors are doing. Okay. You're going to have investors and do have investors who are still very interested in investing in what I call hard asset companies because they understand it. Yeah. And they like that business. Right. Um, Tried and true. This is what we do. This is what we've always done. And it's going to work in the future as well. And, and there will always be a market for it, basically. Right. So, so and, safe, safe bet. And when I use the word investors, like so, it can be a, uh, an investor meaning like private equity or yeah. um, venture capital, but also investor meaning strategic, right? So yeah. the companies that we work for, right? Like yeah. it just just makes sense to do that. Um, I think that um, you know when it comes to uh, you know looking at things that are um, newer um, that are asset light. Uh, I think that's where we're going to see, I think, kind of more energy and more talk, okay. right? Because again, I think what we're seeing with the implementation of the actual use of big data, and I think there are aspects or there are areas of pharma they've been using for a long time, like yeah. e even when it comes to Salesforce targeting and Salesforce effectiveness, sure. like, that um, those tools are incredibly useful why because you can take an incredibly powerful workforce already and make them that much better uh, and so I think because the innovation cycles are shorter uh, because they tend to be asset light and because it's really clear that when you put better tools in the hands of knowledge workers good things happen we're going to continue to see a lot more investment there um, and I think it's easy now to I say not easy like it's easy but um, relatively easy uh, to get into that space right now because it's a little bit like you know for our global you know audience I'll pause it for using the American analogy the Wild West right but yeah. it's it's there's a lot of opportunity right yeah. so like you can look at the landscape and you can so you can see as far as you as as, um, as the eye can see if you will um, five years from now it's going to be different so how you invest in what you do is going to is going to need to be different so um, anyway. Go. So we in recovery? Uh, I think so. I think there's been a lot of talk about um, the um, investment dollars, no matter where you sit, staying on the sideline. I think that um, staying on the sideline just isn't going to work for people anymore. I mean, nobody's going to do anything stupid like that. Doesn't make any sense. I'm not saying that, right? Um, but you, all of us just can't continue to sit on the sideline anymore, right? I yeah. Mean, look, the era of free money is over. It was fantastic. Yep. It, it was, was fantastic. great. I mean, come on, I guess look at that dreamy look when I think about it, right? Yes. So do a lot of people, but yes, fancy that's over. Land. It's over, right? Yeah. It's so over. this is the new normal. Right. This is the reality we have to deal with. There's going to be impact from that. That's fine. Let's just let's just move on. Ultimately, what it does is I think it drives the um, focus around what's it going to take to create value, right? And that means innovation. So we're going to have to innovate differently. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Right. Good Those thing. signs of, um, I'll say, competitive forces right, or pressures are really a good thing. I mean, we don't like them because it means we have to move off of where we are today. And yeah. I, don't, I love to talk about change and transformation, but I hate it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that's just the reality that we live okay. in. And I think it's ultimately, I think it's a good thing. And it's, I think there's a lot to be excited about. So, yeah. It's, are trillions of dollars going to flow into healthcare tomorrow? No. 
but um, the, the, the right money is going to go to the right places always that are innovating that are exciting promising there's always going to be money for always for the novel always that's that's that is look you can there's a lot of things you can not like about the system and judge it yeah. negatively yeah but good ideas with great management teams yeah and leaders will always get the opportunity to see the light of day yeah yeah. And that's a great thing. And do you see opportunity for the small, mid-sized biotech players? Because there is going to be a patent cliff that's going to happen here with some of the blockbuster drugs out there, molecules, right? We need that next generation really to start coming on, on now. And obviously, we can't necessarily discover it from scratch, like, you know, in time. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of looking around for interesting assets. So are you starting to observe this as well or yeah. already? Yeah, I think I think that the, the, the uh, <clears throat> we'll call it so the near term innovation funnel is, is really robust. The, the new product introductions, I think, is, is going to continue to be. Yeah. Um, Excellent. Yeah, actually, I mean, we're seeing a lot of the biotech yeah. getting, you know, consolidated as well, yeah. and, or their assets are being consolidated by a larger player. So, you know, more investment there. Um, and is there really still a lot of companies that that have their own in-house capabilities to kind of formulate and do early CMC, or are they really just is is it really an outsourced paradigm at this point? Like they're really you know, getting their chemists at work and then sending it, you know, where they can scale it up, where they can really count on it to be done. I think, uh, I think, I think the, I'll say the mega trend is to, um, outsource. Yeah. The Across talent the is so good. Yeah. Uh, and if we were talking about service earlier yeah. and, and when the talent is good and the service is great, the, the world will be the path to your door because it just makes financial sense to do it that way. Yeah. Right? The only time there, there's a, a challenge is when the service is bad. Right. So a lot of times the service is bad, right? And I think there's a lot that overall the industry can do to bring a service mentality to what we do. Like so many times, like when I'll go, go visit a CDM, I'll, I'll ask him, you know, what business are you in? Yeah. And the answer is always interesting. We're in the business of developing methods, we're in the business of releasing products, right? We're in the business. Yes, that's all true. It's a service business. Right. Though. But are you in the business yeah. of service providing? Yeah. Right. And, and for me, like when I'm when I'm out and about in the world and I ask that question, it's you know the natural part of the conversation. When the companies say we're in the service business, like that is a company to really um, let's say pay attention to yeah. do business with right? yeah and, when they sort of start there yeah absolutely. and then they tell you about the other absolutely right and that, attributes that, that, that they have and that's been my experience that's been my experience of, of all sciences yeah. uh, absolutely yeah. and it just it just again it's organic and it happens naturally yeah so. yeah very carefully curated but it yeah. makes a difference and, absolutely you know for those that it resonates with which you know is many um it, it really resonates home very well so it's very gratifying you know, to, to see that happen, to go from a vision to a reality to us, you know, putting out uh, finished solutions to the to the market. So it's been really exciting. Yeah, outsour exciting. Uh, to, to your point earlier, I mean, out out outsourcing is here to stay. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I think for me it was interesting, right? Just go, kind of go back to that conversation about the passage of time. So I was at CPHA Worldwide last year. Um, and, this is a uh, huge show, by the way. Amazing. So uh, anybody in this audience who hasn't yeah. seen that show. Um, it's buildings. Yeah. Like 70,000 people, right? Yeah. Or something like that. Start working yeah. your boss for the plane ticket now, <laughs> right? Um, I've so, already authorized my two BD to go. So uh, awesome. there you go. Right. And they, and, they and, were like, have to book now. <laughs> and hotel rooms are starting to become scarce. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to stay, you know, totally. uh, out towards, you know, Lenate Airport or something like that. But yeah. um, it, it's... It, it is a it is a great show, uh, and I think when I was reflecting uh, last year, it was really incredible to see the impact of the um, increased investment in pharma services. Yeah. Um, whether it was strategic dollars coming in from companies who are already in the space or um, investors coming in, it's really done a lot to um, make that ecosystem be robust and be able to deliver really for any company with any molecule, yeah. you can work with a service provider. So the beauty of that for 
uh, you know, the person with the idea for the, the molecule is you don't have to worry about how you're going to get it done anymore. Yeah. You really don't. Yeah. You need to know what are you going to do with this product. Yeah. Do you, are you actually bringing something to the market that's innovative, that is going to make the patients better? And yeah. look, it's, it's a business like anything else. Are the insurance company or the regulators going to go sign off on so it? Right? Commercialization because commercialization strategy still from the get-go, right? I, yeah. Because if payers aren't going to touch it. No, I mean, it, look, there's, yeah. there, there's unfortunately a, that stops a lot of molecules right then and there. And, and I think that's, that, and I think that's also, we're talking about, you're asking about like where are investment dollars flowing, they're flowing into the companies and the businesses that provide those kinds of insights. Why? Cause it's a, it's a yeah. black box to a lot of folks. And, <laughs> And, and there was just a really high profile example with, um, you know, the, um, the UK regulators, nice. And a, um, uh, a, a treatment that, you know, AstraZeneca wanted to get, uh, you know, listed for, for reimbursement and, you know, and they said no. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to continue to see, you know, more and more of that, you know, just, just because the, I think that the innovation, um, funnel is so robust right now that I do think that the payers, while they're worried about their economics, I think they can also kind of afford to be selective and send messages where they think it's appropriate right. because we do need to have more breakthrough innovations, right? Incremental yeah. innovation is a good thing, um, but we do need more breakthrough innovation. So for whatever reason that the pressure comes on the innovation cycle, like yep. we talked about this earlier, yep. you know, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, whether or not you know any regulator's decision or a payer's decision is a good thing for their patients, that's a different thing. I'm not judging that one way or another. Of course, I don't but, think any of us ever do. Right? But, but, the, the but that is comes. the reality that needs to be considered up front, yeah. for sure. Yeah. You know. Um, okay, so I'll pivot a little bit. There's some real blockbuster molecules that are really going to, I think, change the, not only the dynamic of healthcare, but the macro environment that surrounds it. So well, let me think what it could be. Could it going, be? I don't know. Could I don't be? know. I don't know. It's, uh, well, Our focus on, uh, GLP one. Yes, there, there, there it is. There it is. We're, we're 45 minutes. Yes, in. We finally like mentioned GLP one. Yeah. I mean, the impact already is, is evident. Um, not only does it, you know, bring, I think life-saving opportunity to many who need it. It, uh, also provides feeds maybe our need for, for some vanity and, uh, sure. some other things, mm -hmm. uh, there as well. But, uh, you know, obviously could really affect a lot more businesses and things like that as people change their habits or mm -hmm. uh, become more health conscious as the result, you know, maybe of uh, the drug's performance. Mm -hmm. um, so from a CDMO per perspectives, right? Like if these are continuing at the rate that they're continuing, more and more companies will get into their manufacture or looking at, you know, modifying how they work. Um, you know, is there going to be room for the innovators that are working on the novel stuff? Are there going to be more shift to just pure scaling of manufacturing uh, space mm. for some of these blockbusters that are that are out there? Yeah, I, every question is like for me is like a home run. <laughs> I'm like, wow, there's just a lot to there's a lot, there's to, lot to unpack there, there right? Really is, there really is a lot to unpack there, but I think. Uh, <clears throat> we'll be thinner at the end. So. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, me too. Right, um, but I think because uh, where I thought you were going with that question, it took a left-hand turn like, right at the end. Um, but um, I, I. But you can go back the other way. No, 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 no all good. All okay. good. Um, I, I think that um, I, I do think that there's plenty of opportunity, and there's which I'm what I really say, say is there's plenty of capacity yeah. to be able to serve whatever molecules are coming through the pipeline over time. Yeah. We're going to see uh, instances where, okay, capacity is tight in this particular moment in sure. time, uh, whatever that is, a few months, maybe a year, something like that. We're always going to see that. But like over time, the system is resilient it is, it is, it is, it is, and there are smart people who are right. working in the system. And so they can, they look into the future and, and we work with them and you work with them too. Yeah. So. It will constantly evolve. The capacity. They'll get better at what they do. That, more right? efficient. You'll, you'll be more efficient product with the current capacity. You'll add new capacity. Like that's that's the model. That's yeah. That's how it works. Um, and uh, so I think that 
the demand that we're going to see from this you know, mega blockbuster, mega mega product, uh, I think is I think we're feeling it now. But I think over time, uh, it's going to um, that um, tightness in the market is going to abate. Um, I think that again, we're going to continue. the leaders will emerge. They'll be out. Yeah, we're They'll be the front runners. And we're going to continue to see incremental innovation around yeah. those products. Yeah. Uh, the and whole. they're learning more and more about their expanded capabilities as well. Turns out, you know, seems like it could be far, far reaching from the initial I thought agree. on them. So, well, I mean, it, so in, in terms of um, how it's going to impact people's lives, yes, uh, I mean, beyond, um, you know, the benefits with respect to, um, you know, weight loss. Obviously, weight loss has been linked for a long time to um, better cardiac outcomes and overall health outcomes. I love having conversations with you, Kurt, uh, on and off screen. Um, <laughs> I think when we were we were last uh, talking, you know, we were really sort of exploring this new mega blockbuster, as you say, uh, sort of categorization of molecules, you know, uh, focused there on, on obesity, weight loss, mm -hmm. obviously very, very good for diabetics. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, these, these new GLP one and, and that's just not even all of the, the sort of flavor of molecules that they're looking at these days, but, uh, just the sort of wide impacts that these seem to be having both on healthcare improvement as well as maybe the, the macroeconomic environment. So what are you seeing from sort of the CDMO manufacturing side to be able to accommodate uh, the demand that is seemingly increasing every single day and, and quite frankly already there and I'm sure will continue. So what are you seeing there? Well, I mean, like so many people, um, I, you know, we all see the same data, like less than 1% of the population who can benefit from GLP-1s are actually taking GLP-1s. And so um, we're, again, just starting on that journey. And even we kind of take a look at you know, what was happening with that market back in 2022, 2021, yeah. when it formed, like it's just been, you know, talk about a power curve or an exponential growth curve, it's just been just been amazing and it seems like every day there's new data that's coming out that says look there's a wider impact for these drugs even beyond uh you know quote unquote what's obvious right yeah. around the diabetes and the weight loss and yeah. the outcomes that are that are a result of that um so yes the demand is going up right you know, from say 50 to 70 million syringes a year for the u.s to it'll be in the hundreds of millions and you know five years from now yeah the great thing about this ecosystem we've been talking about is that it's incredibly responsive, adaptive, and resilient. Right? Um, this is what, quote unquote, we all do in this ecosystem. Yeah. We see that there's a need, right, and we fill that need. And um, so, while today there's definitely going to be some some tight spots in terms of in terms of supply, we're always going to see that. And, yeah. We're always going to see yeah. that. Um, but the system if you will, the ecosystem responds so quickly that I think over time it, it's, you know, it's all going to be fine. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, I, I think it's, let's just continue to, to embrace the future. Um, I think that, um, there will be, uh, sufficient amounts of sterile full finished capacity, you know, globally, um, for the okay. foreseeable future. I think the system will be able to respond to that. I think, there's going to continue to be innovation, um, even with the sterile uh, or the injectable administration yeah. of the product. Um, Who'd have thought the right. average person would be willing to do that? Well, and again, this a week, no problem. Right, but this, again, the idea that right? the technology has come that far, yeah. right? And the audio, auto yeah. auto injectors have been developed to the point where they're they're, they're reproducible and they work and they're yeah. quote, essentially quote, painless. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. um, that's another really interesting aspect of um, in you know in pharma services and manufacturing is the design of the devices and then the assembly of the devices, right? Yeah. So the sterile fill finishes look, it's incredibly important, but then there's, there's those other downstream steps that are incredibly important as well. Um, that we haven't even talked about yet about the oral GLP one in, uh, inhibitors or antagonists, yeah. um, which is really exciting. incredibly yeah. interesting, right? A little more user friendly, right? Yeah. To, well, it's, okay. This whole idea of like, look, look, it's an incredible demand for the injectable product. It's going to continue to grow. <clears throat> There's always going to be a segment of the market that's going to benefit from the injectable product for a whole host of reasons. Right. But you can talk about providing accessibility, like ultimately the, the oral product will sure. provide 
greater accessibility to um, to more people throughout the world, right. right? And just your daily life, I think. Uh, so ease, ease some use. Yeah, but I think it's it's uh, yeah, it's incredible. Like we're just starting. Yeah. Right? I thought you know the the day of the or the era of the mega blockbuster yeah. is over, right? Because again, keep we, we have a few of those already on right? the market, right? right? But it's it's exciting to see that there's a next generation and will continue to be further generations of different molecules or applicability of the molecules that are there. It's just never a dull moment, right? Which is why we're both in this industry, right? And have remained in it for so long because it's so fast moving and exciting and a little gratifying to be a small part of it, right? We, um, one of the things that you were saying that I've been would like to you know get you to, to maybe comment about is that during the break you were mentioning the broader the economic impact yeah. for a product like GLP-1. Yes. That we have never even, we've never seen that before. There was never the possibility of it. We hadn't seen it before. And I, I thought that was a great point. Yeah. Um, you know, really just incredible to see that uh, as people become more dialed in, I think, to health, to wellness, to feeling better, I think it's going to naturally curb your lifestyles and your lifestyle habits. And I think it's going to affect, you know, the food that you buy or the choices you make for where perhaps you go out to eat or how much you eat when you do eat, um, you know, even more widespread, you know, than that. Um, the fact that these molecules seem to be acting on, you know, various parts of your body because these receptors are actually located in quite a few places. So, you know, the, the maybe the main intent of the original molecule was for X, but they're starting to see as it gets in more and more individuals and they continue to study it, obviously through clinical trials, that there seems to be even broader implication, uh, you know, that they could cross over into other therapeutic areas and there's other therapeutic benefit from you taking some of these molecules, which you intended maybe at first for a particular reason, and now you're you're benefiting from another uh, from another way. So I think there's going to be curbing of lifestyle across the board, which I think will will have kind of a macroeconomic effect. You know, whether that's less you know food consumption, alcohol consumption, you know, all our vices, right? All of our all of our so-called fun stuff, I suppose, but. Um, it's good. I think it's a good push towards wellness, health. Um, I think any molecule that can affect kind of inflammation in your body, that seems to be sort of the root of all evil, if you will, seems that that's kind of the generation of all disease. And I think anything you can do to kind of uninvite your genetics to kick in is, is a good plan, you know? So we all want to, we all want to outlive our you know, previous generations, so, and, and live well and have a good quality of life. So I think it's exciting. So in order to keep making these blockbusters, um, the CDMO industry, are they going to expand? Is it going to be the current, the current players are going to expand? Are there going to be new CDMOs that, you know, brand new, like getting into the business? Is it going to explode? Like, I feel like the players in the CDMO space, have been the players in the CDMO space for quite a while. Yeah. You know, the name brands, the specialty manufacturers, the small guys, you know, do you think they'll just continue to expand and then there'll be some consolidation of expertise and maybe they can be a little more broad in what they do for clients? Or do you think there's going to be new, new companies kind of hopping in? So I think it's a great question and, um, you know, a lot about the space too. Yeah. So, um, I think that um, I think there are going to be some new entrants. Uh, I just think, but I think where they're going to come from is companies that are already doing sterile fill finish, and they have their own captive capacity, um, and maybe they've got some challenges with their new product pipeline. Yeah. And what they're going to so they're going to kind of they're going to chase fuller, yeah. fuller. They're going to chase higher utilization in their facilities, sure. and this is an opportunity to do that. Um, so again, I think because this um, market, I think, is going to just grow so quickly and to a, to a level that um, there will be opportunities for companies that have um, sterile supply chains to yep. be able to say, "Hey, um, I've got five or ten million of capacity, and 
um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open to putting that capacity, you know, into my facility, and I, I don't see it as um, really competitive force or taking share from any any of the any of the existing players, right? Um, I would they, imagine there's going to be that cursory look across the industry to see <clears throat> who does have <clears throat> capacity or who could scale up capacity, and they're going to be kind of sought after, I would think. So. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it is absolutely happening right now. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure if somebody looked at the um, immigration records, you know, into Northern Europe would, would find that, you know, there's a very clear pattern, right? Um, but, but, I, but I think, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, there will be some new entrants like we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that the existing players they, they know how to make these investments. They have the capital to make these investments yeah. and it, it will make sense for them to. And they'll enter into that. like strategic yeah. partnerships Has and. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Well, one, of the, one, of the, one of the bigger challenges in the services business is knowing that you have the demand. Yes. Right? So predictability, building, forecastability, right? visibility. Right? I, mean, I don't ever hear those words. I've never asked for any of that stuff. <laughs> no, well, right? but and the because <laughs> the crystal is, ball. Right. Well, yes. and the because is right. There's a yes. the, there's there's a return that's that's needed on the you know the dollars or the euros or or right. the world sure. invested right. and. Um, so, in order to have certainty around making that investment, because the capital dollars are so large yeah. and the investment cycles are so long, the ability now for customers to be able to, as you said, enter in a strategic partnership because yep. they know what the demand profile is going to look like, yep. should accelerate, or I believe it will accelerate, um, you know, the capital deployment cycle, right? And um, again, the ecosystem will become more responsive because there's that sort yeah. of external pressure to yeah. do that. Uh, 100% that's going to happen. Will it push aside some of our innovators? Will it make it harder for them? Or do you really feel the players who are going to devote you know, their resources towards these blockbuster molecules are going to be separate than the ones that are really going to focus on more of these novel innovator other you know, molecules? I, th I think that the, the, the different um, players in the ecosystem, I think they're, they're it's just going to continue on that way. You have expertise and the ability to operate economies of scale when you're working on the mega blockbusters yeah. that you don't have in the smaller companies. And because of the, the way that the cash flows come into those companies, they have the ability to um, let the innovation cycle play out in those smaller companies, right? And then come in later in their innovation cycle when the risks are lower. Yeah. Even if it's more expensive for them to, to, um, acquire or license those products, it's fine. They have the capital to do that. That's yep. fine. Um, so there will always be this this need for small and medium size, you know, biopharma companies to really drive that innovation cycle on their role. We talked yeah. about this earlier, there will always be investors for whether you're strategic or uh, a sponsor um, with good ideas, with great management yeah. teams, right? There's, yeah. there's plenty of money out there for yeah for those um, good ideas. I feel like it's just even more opportunity for these small, yeah, mid-sized players really to specialize, to really grab some of this novel work that I see every day, which I'm very fortunate to, to visit these clients. Um, it's always, you know, very humbling to see like what they're working on and be part of it. It's great. Um, and then, you know, maybe then you move it to a larger player, right? Yeah. When you're in full scale, because to your point, Absolutely. they're the experts at sort of, okay, we got this going. It's it's working like clockwork. Um, and, and maybe there'll be some diversification there in their portfolios, right? Where they'll be a little more devoted. I guess it's always a little risky, right? Too many, too many eggs in one basket, but uh, these mega molecules don't seem to be going anywhere soon. So. I was gonna say it's a it, it, it's a big basket and there's some good stuff in it. So uh, yeah. I think it, I think it's in good hands. I'm yeah. thinking a little bit about when when you were you know making your comments. It's Olympic season, right? I mean, yeah. it's, it's really I think of it as a, as a relay, right? You've got early development and discovery, and then it gets relayed to the biopharma companies. They raise capital wherever they yeah. do that, private or public markets, uh, and then ultimately the the good ideas that make it through all those hurdles, they, they do get quote yeah. put into the right hands where you can operate or you can you can you can operate and you can get these these drugs out, you know, on yeah. a on a global And there's scale gonna be a lot of space that. for it because yes. the pioneers are there. 
Absolutely. And they know it works. Yes. And so I, I think there'll be a plenty of investment, continued investment opportunity for the future to, to have, you know, more options, more versions, you know. Well, if, if, I mean, I'm looking at this way. If, if if we were in the you know the the large pharma companies and the you know, the, you know, the, the the mega pharma companies, you, you can have a very high degree of confidence that the innovation ecosystem it's going to continue to yeah. work. Right? Yeah. Again, we talked about this earlier that the CDMO, CMO, CRO service model. It works. It works. It, it will deliver. It works. There's yep. there's no doubt about that. Yeah. An investor, no matter from where they sit, does not have to worry about can we do the development work. Yep. We it's don't need to invest there. in that. Mm-hmm. We can focus on the idea. We can focus on what the end market demand is and how we're going to cure exactly. patients and help you know the you know the providers do their jobs better. Yeah. So if you've got like your mega molecules here. What's what's kind of next in line? Is that like you're selling gene therapies, or like what's kind of right sitting right under that? I think what I think what's going to emerge uh, in the next two to three years is going to be the um, mRNA therapy. Yeah, I do think okay. that. Um, look, it's obviously it's really clear that it works for for vaccines. I think sure. uh, we're going to see that the targeting challenges for the mRNA are going to get solved. Um, I think when it comes to the cell and gene therapy, uh, look, it's it's relatively early yeah. in the overall clinical development of these treatments. There's absolutely been successes. We're going to continue to see them, right? Yep. Um, you know, there's some great reports that, that are put out there about the outlook for the cell and gene therapies. I think uh, CVS Health is one that puts uh, puts this report out. It's actually excellent, um, and uh, it's it's available off of their website. Um, so uh, I think again, this is not uh, "quote unquote" rocket science, but like what needs to get worked out is um, what is a payer? Uh, yeah. How how are they going to support access? Yeah. Right. Those kind of economic and business decisions have to be made. Um, I think as we start to talk about the different types of um, cell therapies, I think. The logistics challenges, you know, come up quite a bit. But again, when you talk to people in the now, like they understand that this is yeah. the challenge, and they understand how to solve it. Yeah. Um, there is no problem with um, acquiring cells, shipping them someplace, having them be transformed, and then go back to the patient. There is no issue with that. Okay. Um, the global logistics supply chain, cold chain, it all exists, it works, yeah. okay? It's a lot more about the technology that you need to, to, to use to Yeah, and that. maybe yeah. the timeline, right? Yeah. Like, I'm just, you know, envisioning, you know, maybe it's taking longer in formulation, manufacture, you know, analytical scale up if you're working on some of these cell and gene therapies than maybe if you're doing like a small molecule, mm-hmm. you know? So maybe that you can talk a little bit about like the timetable, like the difference in sort of CDMO involvement time, if you will, right? Because maybe maybe I'm already waiting three months to get my spot in the CDMO mm-hmm. or six months to get my spot. And now I also have a therapy that's, you know, just from the pure technological point of view of making it just takes longer than some of the others so and another great question so i think over the last three years maybe five years it's changed quite a bit so yeah. better they're better it's better. much it's much yeah. better now you have there's 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 much more capacity that's available right yeah. depending on from where you sit that's a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing right i mean yeah. um and but there's there's much more capacity that's available the level of sophistication with which the supply chain uh, on the on the patient side right whether it's you know, harvesting or delivery or both to the yeah. patient is just so much better um, there's there's really um, some great companies who are doing great work and ultimately what they're doing is they're leveraging the tools that are already available already in other industries so not reinventing no. things just getting smarter and uh, more pinpointed on what they're focused on and working on. I think one of the challenges for overall the pharmaceutical um, business, and, and I think maybe really any you know, regulated healthcare industry, is um, what is really the benefit of being an early adopter, right? So yeah. most of the time, it's the, the appropriate strategy is to be first to be second, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that's that approach is starting to break down because 
the world is just so dynamic these days, right? And I think there's a lot more people in the life sciences and healthcare form looking left and right and saying, well, I'm not going to take the time to, to home grow this and develop it here. I'm going to leverage something or utilize something that yeah. I know already works in other parts of or in, in other businesses. And so I think, um, again, healthcare has come a long way in the last 30 years in terms of like that kind of an approach, but yeah. again, coming all the way back to that point around the vitality and the necessity and the proven capability of the pharma services um, yeah. industry has enabled all of that. Yeah. I mean, it's really and fully enabled. It continues to fully enable yeah. you know, this transformation of you know the you know the the business and the delivery of health. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I guess we've really focused a lot on innovation and what's new, what's blockbuster. But there's obviously a ton of very successful medication out there that needs to continue to get manufactured. So. Um, still plenty mm -hmm. that they're working on that's been around and tried and true for a long time, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, super exciting time, uh, yeah. for sure. Uh, I'm definitely looking forward to, to my next five years in the industry because it's it's been amazing to kind of see the pre-COVID, what kind of came out of COVID, yeah. and now kind of where we're propelling. So that's been super exciting. Great. Thanks for listening. It was great to be with my friend and industry leader, Kurt Nielsen from Expert Insights, who I always enjoy speaking to. Thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned for more podcasts from Alta Sciences.